thank you so much for when uh, Quan asked me about two weeks ago and said, I need to film the spot. I said, I cannot let down my distant cousin. I actually looked up. No, I'm just kidding. We're not cousins. And I'm not Korean either. OK, so. Um, neither am I. OK, I knew that. So all right. You don't look Jewish. Uh, I'm afraid I feel guilty all the time. All right, so now. Um, a, a, a long time ago, one of the things that I really have to say is that, um, kidding aside from sort of distant cousins, interventional pulmonology is not a field that we invented anything new. We are borrowers. We borrow a lot of things. In, in fact, you know, from a diagnostic standpoint, which I talked to you a little bit about, it, hopefully it's not too boring to you, EBA staging, we borrow it from the gastroenterologist. It's just a matter of miniaturization of technology that can go from the esophagus to the windpipe. So miniaturization is the theme of how we slowly evolve. But ultimately, what we do in terms of the therapeutics, we borrow from you guys. In fact, the forefather of Richard Bronchoscopy is not a pulmonologist, not a thoracic surgeon, but that's right, and Dr. Gustav Killian also. So these are the forefathers, and we are lucky enough to be able to share the passion, and we and I'm very happy to be here. So uh, I think that in terms of what we do, we really have to understand first and foremost, we are clinicians. We are not proceduralists. So uh, I see a lot of patients in clinics stratify abnormalities of the lung, physio physiology, and stratify what this is a malignant or benign lesions, and work from the mindset as a clinician. But from the procedural standpoint, we do do a lot of diagnostic and therapeutic procedures. And lung cancer management is one of the core of what we do. And I would devote a third of the talk to that. And I'll talk a little bit about lung cancer staging. So if that is too much out of your domain, I apologize. But it is the core of what we do. We certainly do a lot of benign airway diseases. Back in Deaconess, you know, we were the big center of tracheobronchomalacia, idiopathic uh, subluxed stenosis. And one of the, the, the really fun part of it is that we have the ability to interact with a lot of specialists, such as you guys, the laryngologist. So we were able to really get a lot of uh, collaboration out of that. So just to give you a couple of examples, um, this is when I was in Boston. So a long time ago now, there's a 40-year-old attorney who used to run on the Charles, around the, uh, along the Charles River all the time. But had fell over the last few months progressively with shoulder breath. And um, one thing led to another. Uh, she got a CAT scan. And you don't need to be a radiologist to know that you, know, you can see a luminal mass there. So this is what the diagnostic bronchoscopy looked like. It has a lot of features that probably would point you in terms of differential diagnosis of one versus another. It's a very sheen-like vascular tumor that's attached to the mucosa. But I think what is really the key is that, amazingly, being 95% occluded about the main carina, she's still running. So <laughs> that's a testament of youth. So um, we, uh, the, the nice thing about integration is that we can convert from a flexible bronchoscopy in the conscious sedation setting, and it will convert to general anesthesia and rigid bronchoscopy very quickly. And that would be a testament of what Dr. Ernst did in terms of the uh, integration. We don't do much of this anymore, but one of the things that autofluorescence bronchoscopy is nice is that it really does have a high sensitivity to, to look at atypia features and able to delineate what is an abnormal juncture between a normal and an abnormal mucosa. The absorption wavelength versus white light bronchoscopy is able to highlight the features of what's normal and abnormal. In this case, this tumor does spare the main carina. And uh, we, at the same time, this is under rigid bronchoscopy, is able to just do a biopsy, debreed it. You don't, the, the enemy of per, is good, is perfect. You just get enough of an airway, drag in the thoracic surgeon next to him, do the measurements for him, and design a protocol for him. Uh, any idea what this is? It's a lot of central airway disease. It's adenocystic carcinoma. And uh, this patient underwent definitive uh, trachoresection and XLT. And is, as far as I know, is still doing well. 
So that's just a one highlight of example. It's I hate to use IP as a gimmick because a lot of times do scenting or all this stuff, but it's really about integration of DC's paradigm. And hopefully with this talk, I can really highlight that that's what I want to accomplish. So Dr. Gilling did the first Richard Bronchoscopy, actually. And um, he's also ENT physicians. The first Richard Bronchoscopy is done local, anesthet local anesthetics. And it's retrieval of a chicken bone from the right main bronchus. And the patient is upright. They used also topical cocaine also. Uh, but this is how they did it in the old days. Um, this guy looks shocked, may have been a medical student, but he looked a little old for that. So in terms of what we do in terms of airway, the, the revolution of bronchoscopy came in the 1960s. Dr. Aikida uh, invented the flexible fiber bronchoscope. It's, so rev it's obviously very revolutionary because now a rigid bronchoscopy can be done in a very s much simpler manner, a lot less invasive. Uh, he was a left-handed person. That's why all the bronchoscope is designed for the left hand to hold. Just a little trivia. But, um, so, uh, but uh, since then, you know, with the next decades that ongoing, we have different techniques to, uh, to evaluate diffuse lung disease, such as a bronchoalveolar lavage for infectious disease. A few years later, Dr. Kopan Wong, who is now in Baltimore and still practicing, um, uh, uh, lymph node biopsy blindly without endobronchial ultrasound is still practicing in Memorial of Baltimore, amazingly. The Yak laser came about and um, uh, brachytherapy that we, we actually, Stanford does not have a high dose brachytherapy program. So we are now finally going to bring in a physicist who's interested in brachytherapy. They go bring in a junior faculty and we're going to start a high dose uh, rate endobronchial brachytherapy program. Uh, video bronchoscopy, and then Dr. Dumont, uh, which is all the Stan talk, really started in, from France in the silastic or silicon sense. So nowadays, what do we do in terms of our spectrum? We divide into diagnostic and therapeutic. I'm certainly not going to bore you with everything that we do here. Uh, I will talk about endobronchial ultrasound. You know, you guys have the staging of the neck lymph node for an ENT tumor. We have our own language in terms of endobronchial ultrasound for thoracic oncology. Uh, we do a lot of electromagnetic navigation now in terms of a peripheral lung lesion. I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm not going to talk about anything else on the diagnostic side. And then the last part of the talk, I'll talk about what we do in terms of tumor obstruction, debridement, different thermal ablative devices, and stenting. A lot of it is really uh, video, so you guys hopefully don't fall asleep too much. But we do deal a lot with other smaller benign airway pathology. We now do bronchiothermoplasty for asthma. You may or may not have heard about it. For those who may be interested in the allergy sinus diseases, uh, we actually now do thermoplasty to cause a heat energy denaturation of um, submucosal smooth muscle to attenuate the smooth muscle constriction during an attack. And I'll talk a few slides about that. We are looking into bronchoscopic lung volume reduction using an endobronchial Heimlich valve to cause volume reduction endoscopically. And we are looking to bring in a trial next year to, to place valves in the lung for patients with uh, significant hyperinflated lungs due to emphysema. And uh, we also, uh, yeah. Uh, so anyways, lung cancer is bad. That's the point of it. The higher the stage, the worse the prognosis. Staging is dictated by lymph node involvement, not unlike what you guys are familiar with. But for surgical patient, the end status is the most important thing. It is the, the ring that rules it all. And also, when I was in New York, you know, whenever you need to send patient a memorial for trials, it's going to be end status. Thoracic tumor board, if you were to discuss about a multidisciplinary approach, you know, we have the core people, if you come to our conferences, are really going to be the thoracic surgeon, the medical oncologist, the thoracic ones, Dr. Wakeley, uh, and Dr. Neal at Stanford, and then the radiation oncologist. To, to be purists, those conferences are really designed for the 3A patients, where all modalities can be considered but we'll make it a little simple. 
Unfortunately, lung cancer is a very silent disease. And most of the patients, when they are diagnosed, belong to the later phase. Uh, we're talking about seven, almost 70%. Um, and then the early stage for people who are more of a curative resectable patients um, are, are unfortunately the minority of it. And now with the non-smoking Asian female being the new window of lung cancer or the new story, and they're behaving so aggressively, it really is an imperative for us to find out the, the pathogenesis, mutation analysis, and you know, the cancer center certainly, hopefully, will have a lot of play in that along with us. Um, so this is a sort of a quick, quick thing about uh, staging of lung cancer, and I'll convert to EBUS sampling. N0 is no lymph node. If you have a right side dominant lesion, N1s are your hyaline nodes, which is after the takeoff of your right main bronchus. So anything that's beyond the takeoff right or the left main is going to be N1 node. Anything ipsolary on the right side, including the subcarina, which is considered ipsolaryal node, is N2. Anything across the midline, given that this is, we're talking about right side dominant lesion, becomes N3 or any supraclavicular lymph node gives you N3 contralateral status. Why is that important? Well, number one, in terms of assessing this lymph node, the, the gold standard is still going to be a mesthinoscopy. Um, however, with the caveat that mesthinoscopy does not reach every single lymph node in terms of what we talked about, hyaline nodes and mesthino nodes. Station 2 is defined as lymph nodes paratracheal above the, the arch of the aorta, while station 4 is below the arch of the aorta. And then 7 is the crinal node. And, and then you have the periaortic lymph node, which is station 5. This is pretty much what mesthinoscopy can get to. Anything beyond it, unless you are Valerie Rouge at Memorial Sloan Kettering, that does an extended cervical lumis diagnostic that swing the scope around the aorta into the station six. Uh, it needs to be done by VATS. So what's amenable? These is, this is basically what I drill into my fellow every day going to bed. You need to know your nodal status. So anything peritracheal um, below the atrial aorta, the orange one, is four. When you have the green or the teal-like color, that's uh, subcrinal. And then as you go and move along the right main bronchus, then you become the hyaline node. And we're going down as we speak. And then you have the bilateral hyaline nodes. A classic example in the benign disease of involvement would be sarcoidosis. So this is what a EBUS camera looks like. It basically is an integrated flexible bronchoscope with fiber optics. It's got a channel for lens and a 30 degree, um, and, and a working channel that allows a 22 gauge needle to come out with aspiration technique. Uh, then you have a uh, convex probe that you can pack against the mucosa. This is what we look at. For example, in this case, this is a, this is a uh, L time. So this is a hyaline node uh, that the EBUS looks at, and you're looking at the parking along the mucosa. The cartoon basically looks at the Doppler avoiding the vasculature. In this case, it's the VPA, and then basically parking it in there. And th this is what we look at in terms of the limb cell station. And so the nice thing is that it's a real, li real life um, staging on the real time. And we, a lot of times, we get rapid on site to come and confirm that we have adequacy of tissue. So this is basically what we stratified. You know, in terms of all the lymph node stations that you probably don't really have to know after this talk, um, that you have the high, upper, lower peritracheal to the seven, the last um, mesthinal nodes, and then on to your hyaline nodes. Mesthinoscopy reaches about a few of them. EBUS reaches a lot more. And don't forget the gastroenterologist. The gastroenterologist does EUS, endoscopic ultrasound via the esophagus, and they can actually reach the peroxophageal lymph node, the pulmonary ligament. So if you combine a quote-unquote, I hate to say it, a medical mesthinoscopy, 
that Dr. N Chen, who's the director of US here, we plan to combine a room together where EBUS US can be combined for one setting that we can do systemic sampling for lung cancer. Now we say, wow, is this going to put Dr. Strig out of business? Well, diplomatically, I'll say no. But realistically, I say no. Because you really have to understand what is. I, I won't give you too many statistics. But I think it's really important to stratify what testing accuracy, depending on what the modality you're doing. So you can say, OK, I'll look at all the cervical mesthinoscopy picture with Dr. Strager, Dr. Chang Hong, and Brian Bird did that. And you're like, OK, the sensitivity is 78%, specificity 100%. Well, the literature of specificity is sort of superficial because you don't really do a thoracotomy as a gold standard confirm. If it's positive, it's positive. So it's really about the ruled out ability and then translating to the false negative. And you'd be like, if you just look at sensitivity itself, that's not as good as EUS or EBUS. But you also have to understand, as in all cancer literature for diagnostic testing, it's the population of patients that you're looking at. By definition, EBUS and EUS, we select for the more prominent lymph nodes. By definition, a population has a higher prevalence of lung cancer. So by higher prevalence, you translate to a not as good negative predictive value. You miss one in a prevalence of a higher population of cancer, you're going to have a worse false negative value. So, it's, so my, my point being is that EUS and EBUS does not replace mesinoscopy. It's a complement. If you have someone with an abnormal CT scan of an enlarged lymph node that you have a higher pretest clinical probability of cancer, you do the EBUS to prove positive to stage as high as you can, just like I'm sure ENT. But if you have a lung tumor that has a relatively small lymph node, whereas the EBUS may not prove true negative, you need a mesdinoscopy to true, prove the true negative. So that, that's really the point here. We don't replace it. We stratify in terms of patient selection, and we prove true negative by the gold standard mesdinoscopy. We prove higher stage of lung cancer by EBUS. So that's how we melt together thoracic surgery. So we're not running people out of business anytime soon. OK, so what are other toys that we play with? So other than lymph node staging, we look at basically peripheral lung nodules. And now with the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial that is now recommended by the US Preventive vo uh, uh, Force, they, we are now going to face with a big crisis. Now all smokers who smoke for 35 years between age 50 and 79 are going to be candidates of lung cancer screening by low dose CT. So the good thing is that it saves lives. It's a 21% mortality benefit, 7% overall mortality benefit. In fact, it's the only screening trial that shows overall mortality benefit because it, it picks up aneurysm, aortic aneurysm, and so to speak. The problem is that CT scan is so sensitive to the nodule, we have an inordinate false positives. Any nodule can be granulomatous, it can be a hematoma. So the majority of patients are going to be a false positive because it's too sensitive. So the problem is that we are going to be facing with, along with the surgeons and thoracic radi radiologists, like what do we do with the intermediate probability of nodules? Do we keep watching? Do we resect? So anyway, one of the tools that we use is navigation bronchoscopy. What the hell is it? Well, basically, in the old days, you have a lung nodule less than two centimeters, and you think that you could do a bronchoscopy and find out what that is. Good luck. There's no way. People who say that I can do a bronch and pick up a nodule from a CT scan that's in the parent uh, less than two centimeters, they <coughs> lie. It's no way. So, well, how do we do to augment this ability? We are not talking about a home run. We're not going to replace interventional radiology. But what we do nowadays that we do in endoscopy now is that the patient undergo a CT scan, they have a particular protocol. Basically, it's going to create a roadmap for you in the triplanar representation and able to create for you a virtual bronchoscopy. The algorithm, the nice thing about the lung is that it is a fixed pathway. 
So basically, a computer algorithm can tell you how to get from point A to point B, like a GPS. So what we do is, after we do the CAT scan, uh, we basically have a planning laptop that you know, we do. It's like a video game, so I'm very lucky in what I do. Um, so basically, we can mark the spot, and the computer would basically generate a roadmap for us. In this case, this is a right upload nodule. And based on the airway tree configuration, it's going to tell me, go into right upload, posterior assignment, then apical subassignment. And what it does is that it will eventually get as close to it as possible. The next thing that, uh, by having this route is that under real time, how do you know that you are there? So what it does is that you, we have an electromagnetic field for the patient that they lie on the table. The bronchoscope is equipped with a uh, transponder that emit basically conform to the X, Y, and Z field. And basically during the bronchoscopy, it marries with the CAT scan that was done and when you're going through the airway, because of the X, Y, Z, we marry it, and we basically try to get as close as we can. You say, wow, this must be your magic bullet. No, it's not. The diagnostic yield for two centimeters above, it's about 75 to 80%. It's a whole lot better than 30%. But the nice thing of the bronchoscopy approach is that it has less than 1% of the morthorax rate, while a IR biopsy is about 20%, with about 10% needing chest tube, um, chest tube management. So basically, this is all we do. It's, I, I'm not trying to make humor of it. It's basically a video game. You follow the path. The green dot is your target. And you matching the green dot within your target lesion. So you're just con constantly matching your green dot to your target. Once you match, it tells you what is your variance of distance. You want it to be less than 5 millimeters. And you biopsy the hell out of it. So that's basically it. Um, so that's just showing different ways. And we borrow, just like the whole theme, we borrow now our catheter by the interventional radiologist. We basically use a different angulation of 45, 90, 180 degrees that we can sneak through it and marry the tip at the same time. So that's essentially what we do. Um, I'm not going to uh, bore you, but again, if you're going to ask, hey, how, if I were to advise a patient, less than two centimeter peripheral, I'll say not a very good chance we'll get it. Two centimeter, proximal two thirds of the lung, 80% with an air, bronch air bronchus sign. So that's my rule of thumb. Uh, this is one example of uh, a pathway to the right lower lobe. Uh, this is basically one system. This is not the system we use at Stanford, but this is just a representation of basically how you follow the pathway down to the right lower lobe, bronchus intermedius, right lower lobe, posterior segment, then two o'clock and so forth. The nice thing about this system at the same time is that now that you can diagnose things, can you help with treating things? And that may be the way for the future. We are now also putting a fiducial marker at the same time that we biopsy, rapid onsite tells us malignancy, then we put a few gold fiducial marker along the lesion. So now the radiation oncologist who utilizes a cyber knife can do respiratory gating allowance to precisely diminish collateral uh, damage during radiation therapy. All right, so let's talk a little bit more of more relevancy to you guys. Um, so this is the plumbing part. So type of airway obstruction by tumor, it's very simple. We have intrinsic obstruction, we have extrinsic obstruction, or we have a mix, nothing more than that. So this is one example of a small cell cancer that is uh, in the main carina. And he was actually striderous, and a intubation would not help because the ET tube does not really pass by it. So this is basically a rigid bronchoscopy that uh, uses a micro debreather that we borrow from you guys. We now make it from 37 centimeters to 45, uh, 45 centimeters, which basically exactly what you guys do for your papillomatosis, and we do the same thing. In fact, this stems from my previous uh, fellow William Lun at Deaconess, and he adopted this. So it's now commercialized, and we use that. So uh, it, it's actually um, quite nice. And after that, um, a problem is that our visual is not always great, because a lot of blood involved during the rigid bronchoscopy. And we put in a Y stand 
to basically stand open the airway. But we'll show you more why stand later. Um, this is a uh, quiz for the other Dr. Sam. What is this? <laughs> this is a papillomatosis. So um, we don't want to laser too much, don't want to blade too much, because it's always this worry that it can aerosolize. Uh, so we certainly do we can do volume ventilation not to jet ventilate, and we can use the micro debrider to suck and trim at the same time. So this is just one example of what we offer. Um, I don't know why that got stuck into it. Okay, so, so these are all the stents that we do. Um, the top roll is your silastic or pure silicone stenting. Uh, you have your Montgomery T-tube for the subglottic stenosis, which obviously you guys are more expert in. Uh, but we, we're able to offer that under rigid bronchoscopy also. Uh, you have your pure silexic stand, your L-shaped stand. The middle one are the more easily placed, the self-expandable metallic night nail stand that may or may not be covered by silicone. In this case, it's partially covered. This one's completely covered. And this one's a bare metal. The key to it is that never put bare metal stand in a normal mucosa. Because two weeks later, that metal is going to granulate into the mucosa. It's going to scar down. And once it's there, to rip it out, it's both nerve wracking and fraught with risk. So you will never, and you should never hear a surgeon put a metallic bare metal stand in a normal mucosa. It's purely designed for malignant disease, where patients' like expectancy is not great. I purely only put in a completely covered silicone stand that's self-expandable. Uh, we do a lot of Y stenting. Uh, I'll, Quan knows why, because we're from the Deaconess School. I'll talk a little bit about that. So this is a case at Stanford about two weeks ago. This is a 37-year woman that was diagnosed with recent exophageal cancer. She has congenital tracheal exophageal fissure that says was repair, and she also has um, exophageal atresia. I don't know if any of that is risk factor of exophageal cancer. I'm not aware of it. But anyhow, she presented emergency room stridorous. You do not need to be a radiologist to realize that this is a pretty bad obstruction. So this is just a quick scan of the trachea. And you can see the tumor almost narrowing it completely. So. Um, we took her to the operating room, and you can see that under a passive pressure ventilation, she has a sliver of trachea left externally compressed. And uh, the extendable stents are very easy to place and easy to adjust. It certainly does not, this is the main carina. So we, the enemy of good is perfect. We got a 30% improvement, get out. So that's the key here. This is done by jet ventilation pretty much all the time. And uh, this is uh, post stand. We do not cure disease. We do not increase quantity of life. We improve palliation, and we bridge to radiation. So this is the stand. Yeah, do you use the Monsoon, the subway? Yes, we do. Uh, in fact, we have borrowed yours. Ours. It's the anesthesiologist. OK, that's true. <laughs> This is a 50-year-old guy who's also with exophageal cancer. What would that be? Yep, so this is a nasty trachea fistula. Am I going to improve its quality of life? Am I going to improve its quantity of life? Absolutely not. Once you have a malignant, she's got a trach, so this is a measurement thing. So this is a stoma on the rigid. Measure the, the crater. He's aspirating like crazy. That's why we're doing it. He wants to go home for Thanksgiving. This was in New York. So we measure it, and we decide on what type of stand to use. And you see this under real-time deployment. The green is your proximal aspect. Uh, this is, a, uh, I think, a 60, six centimeter stand. And you can see deploy under jet ventilation rigid bronchoscopy. And the nice thing is that the airway is completely controlled, uh, like how you guys do it. And you can see it at least patched with the hole right there. He went home, he had turkey, didn't aspirate, but obviously did pass away 
but without asphyxiation. And we put this uh, trait back in. Uh, we don't use a CO2 laser because we don't need to be that refined as you guys. You guys are the surgeons. My favorite modality for thermal ablations is argon. We borrow from the liver surgeons. We borrow from whoever else. It's not a laser. I don't like using yak laser because it's deep penetration. And if you need to debrief a tumor of three centimeter, you might as well just call your wife and you're not coming home tonight. The nice thing about APC is that <coughs> it's a broad brush. You paint it. You do not have to make contact with the lesion. It's biologically ionized, and you can direct to biological tissue. Uh, so it's an ionized gas. This is an example of another exophagic tumor. I didn't do this on purpose, but I have more exophagic CA today than your lung CA. So you can see that this is also a main carinal obstruction. This is the right main bronchus. This is exophagic tumor. So instead of using a laser to debride, you use argon. The thing, nice thing about argon is that you just basically go around it and, and fry it. And the nice thing is that it devitalizes and it coagulates. And the depth of penetration is about three to four millimeter, while yak laser is about six, seven millimeter. When you close to your PA, close to your aorta, I don't like to use yak laser. Although that at Brigham, we did do a lamp study, sheep study that you do see some air bubbles uh, with thermal ablate, uh, with argon too, but it's a very minute thing. So, uh, so this is a debridement procedure. What's the carrier for this? Huh? What's the carrier for that? Uh, you mean the fiber? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tip, it's a ionized, uh, it's got a metallic tip to ionize it. It's got electro, electric, electro, you flow the argon, it produces electricity, and the gas floats out. It, it, it's like a flexible. Yeah, it's completely flexible. Yeah, thing. yeah. So you, stuff, you put in a flexible bronch, uh -huh. or you can put it in your rigid bronch in your channel, and you can direct it by rigid also. But with the flexible, it's a lot easier. We do. You're welcome to use it. <laughs> it's under interventional bronchoscopy. Uh, it's set up for airway. Yeah. It's uh, 0 0.4 cc in terms of flow and 40 joules. So that's what I use. I don't use any more. So, all right, last thing I want to do just for curiosity for you, uh, for you guys is the <coughs> thermoplasty. This is what we do. So 45-year-old uh, mom, we got published in the New York Post, this is my pa uh, a patient. Uh, bad asthma, can't play with the kids, use all the inhalers and not helping out. So this was approved by the FDA a year ago um, as a technology. It's got electroprobe. All it does is that heat your airway like a cup of hot coffee. And you put this in the bronchoscope. It's a very flexible catheter. And this is an example of how we do it. it you, you go down to the airway. This is segmental bronchus. You expand the cage. And it has actually got audible. I, I don't have a speak. I didn't put this audio here. So basically, you go most distal, expand the cage, step on the paddle. The algorithm basically deliver heat energy like a cup of co hot coffee. You do it for 10 seconds, and you close the cage, it comes back more proximal. Until you're covering as much airway as possible. And you're like, how does that work with asthma? The f we don't know. Apparently, that the heat energy does not perturb the mucosa. It basically goes to the submucosal smooth muscle wall, and it denatures, most likely the myosin chain, and then it, it doesn't make the airway bigger. It attenuates the bronchoconstriction during asthmatic attack. So that's the difference. And then maybe some propagation of signaling downstream. I'm curious of the mechanism, and uh, you know, hopefully we'll have some ability to do some research. Uh, not, to be, uh, not to bore you, but the yellow one is the patient who 12 months afterwards we use AQLQ uh, for the quality of life. There's a placebo effect, mind you. We have a sham control study. Patient with asthma underwent a sham bronchoscopy for one hour. We stepped on the paddle, just did not deliver the heat energy. First is the two to one randomized. Two to one got the um, heat and one did not get it. And there is a improvement in terms of statistical significance 
in terms of the mean AQLQ. It is not a home run. Uh, it purely, it's, I use it for patients who have no other recourse. And they've done everything that they can. There's no, um, not a candidate for solar anti-IG therapy. They're on prednisone a lot. Then I'll say, you know what, if you're not a mucus producing bronchitic person, I will willing to do that. So, um, so I, I'm not doing it on everybody. Certainly not like a cheerleader who has asthma with mildly. That would be malpractice. So um, last thing I want to talk, do I have time, actually? Yeah. I do? OK. Um, so in New York, we actually institute a whole algorithm to work up asthma when they got um, um, referred for. And that's linked with the Deaconess trigger bronchomalacia. Trichobronchial malacia is a great mimic of asthma. It's wheezing. You have dynamic airway collapse. So we have now here a dynamic airway CT protocol now. If you guys ever see asthmatic patient, they ask you raw full cord dysfunctions, nothing going on. You just look down a little bit, it looks like the airway is collapsing. Ask for a dynamic airway protocol. Uh, Dr. Dominic Fleischmann, who's an airway imaging guy, now has this. You can order this. And you, it does a quick 64 multi tetral CT, that's all you need. During a passive exhalation, it will show you what the trachea looks like. So it's, so it's during expiration, it's not an expiration. So that's the cool thing about it. So based on this, we actually can stratify either a predominant central airway, f fixed or dynamic, versus a predominant medium small airway. And we stratify to either a bronchiolar disease where there's no collapse centrally, you have a lot of ground glass, atten mosaic attenuation, suggestive of air trapping, versus that you have complete central airway collapse seen in the TBM patients. So I'll give you an example of that. Um, so let's just say if uh, it's, anyways, I'm not going to belabor the technical part of it. So in Boston, if someone has bad asthma but never helped with the bronchodilators, and they're wheezing, the cough is bark-like, you suspect it's a trachobronchial malacia. You can recognize the cough a mile away. And what they did, which we're not doing here yet, maybe I can interest Dr. Demrose, um, is to put in a silicone y stand that basically basically prosthetic for the trachea. It straddles the main carina. The fry tech stand is put in blindly, so it's everything you guys got taught against what you taught. Shove a foreign body in the trachea blindly. Um, and then, but it does have a horseshoe shape that conforms a little bit better. So this is what it looks like after a, uh, this is a before, this is a Malaysia. That's about 80%. It's not the worst I've seen. I usually don't do it until it's like 95% collapse, where the um, main carina is completely obliterated. So this is, uh, Oh, this, I don't know what. This was actually referred for a TBM. In fact, that this is actually a patient with duplication of the left lung and have a few blind pouches. So the protocol actually elicited a lot of interesting studies. But um, so that's what we do for Malaysia. Um, last thing I do, which probably the least um, related to your uh, thing, is to. This is a bad emphysema patients. I mean, this is, if it doesn't show you what smoking does. But what I'm trying to get to the point is that emphysema's lung talks to each other. And that's what we call collateral flow. A while ago, there's this whole excitement about you, if you can collapse the lung bronchoscopically, you cause a advantageous link tension relationship, right? The diaphragm is not pushed down, you're much better. So, so basically, uh, this representation is upper lobe, lower lobe. This is the upper lobe emphysema's lung. And let's just say there's no collateral flow, and you collapse the upper lobe, that's emphysema's, now we have form reduction. The patient starts walking. That's when COPD patients get symptomatic. There's no dynamic hyperinflation exercise. But the problem is that the Achilles heel is that if you have actually collateral flow between the upper and lower lobe, where there's incomplete fissure between the lung, you could actually deflate the lung by plucking the lung. But what happens is that during exercise, 
there's actually refill of flow from the bottom lung to the upper lung. That was what doomed all the studies, the gazillion million industry got shut down. So there's still a few things going on right now. Um, so this is an example of a endobronchiohymic valve. Um, this is the placement of the valve. You find a segment, and it's got a catch to it. And you can see the fish mouth Heimlich valve. Egg and secretion come out, but it can't go in. So the lung is going to slowly deflate. So that's essentially what we're going to bring in next year, analogously. So to summarize, IP, we did not intervene anything. We, we borrow a lot of things, but we'd like to collaborate. So thank you, for Quan, for inviting me. There are a lot of emerging and diagnostic and therapeutic mo modalities to what we do. So we do offer a few things that can improve some quality and palliation. Um, and, but having said that, everything that we do, we don't do it blindly, we're not proceduralists, we are clinicians. So thank you for your attention. Excellent. Any questions? Excellent. When Excellent. you, when you yeah. put in the Y-stent yeah. or trachea yeah. or trachea how often do you have to go back to change them out? Or kind of what's the... Very good question. The Achilles heel for that is the granulation tissue, uh, the yeah. interface. Uh, almost, that's why if I did not express that. I don't put a Y stand for trachea malation patient who is not a surgical candidate. Because I know after two, three weeks that's going to granulate, I'm going to bang to take it out. So I don't have the conversation with the patient. I have the conversation with the patient up front. You have the worst malaysia. Your CT dynamic CT show complete collapse. I'm going to do a diagnostic limits test to stand your central airway, but Let's just say if it's all lower airway, the Y stem would not have helped, right? <coughs> so if I put in the Y stem, you dramatically improve from zero to 10. Then you can get a permanent fix, and I'll talk about that. But I don't, have, I don't do a Y stem without that conversation. For someone who's got a well, BMT patient in Malaysia, I'm not going to put in Y stem. It's, I'm going to take it out three weeks later. Correct. Correct. So what they do is that they do a right thoracotomy, they mobilize the whole trachea anteriorly, they use a Malax mash, trim it a Y, patch it posteriorly, left eye main, and stitch it all the way up. It's not the it's not the mash that's the thing. It takes epithelialization of the posterior membrane into the mash over weeks of time to rigid it. But what do we know about secretion clearance? You lose all that mucociliary apparatus. So there's still a lot of data. It's still a very controversial thing. I am hopefully working with Dr. Paul Bulky here, who's an immunologist here, to see if we can coat the stents with a anti-granulation tissue thing in the future. But that's years away. So it's more of a diagnostic trying to figure out Correct. What's gonna I take it out in three, two or three weeks, regardless. Do you have anything for bronchiectasis in there eventually? Nope. No, so unfortunately, we don't. It, it's, uh, if someone bleeds focally, it's a surgical disease. Uh, if embolization does not help, if you're talking about hemoptysis. Uh, if it is a, a focal disease that soils the lung, the native, uh, the naive lung, then you take it out. Unfortunately, most bronchiectasis is diffused and bilateral. Then you are basically succumb to your airway clearance, your 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 massage, your your the vast high frequency percussion. Bronchiectasis is a very frustrating disease. Uh, fortunately, I don't have to deal with it. How about pulmonary fibrosis? Pulmonary fibrosis, we don't have great data. Uh, we don't have great um, medical therapy um, in terms of the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or the cellular non-specific interstitial pneumonitis is very different. But you're looking to IPF. IPF, we have, you know, you talk about immunosuppressive therapy. The, there's a Panther trial that's new, basically shows that prefer, preferidone, which is an antioxidant, has helped patients to improve their, uh, force, stabilize their force, force capacity and improve lung function. I, you know, I'm not an ILD expert, but IPF, the modality is still oxygen, rehab, and transplant. There's no great drug, even if you talk about cytoxin, that really, in the IPF setting, that really truly improves quantity of life. But now, uh, preferidone, which is the antioxidant uh, chelation of oxygen radical, has now been 
a big excitement in the ILD world. So. Excellent. Yeah. Um, just curious about the distributor uh, field. Yeah. Um, and then also your training. Like, okay. Um, how long has IP been a, a fellowship? And then yes. how many are there in the country? And then also, um, mm -hmm. how much rigid versus flexible from talk do you do? Okay. So I, I'm a medical internal medicine trained. I did my fellowship here 10 years ago. Then it's a one year interventional fellowship. Um, the volume there is about 400 widgets a year per fellow, uh, about 3,000 to 4,000 cases a year. Um, but a lot of it, that's why the ENT and IP became successful. Uh, for me, right now at Stanford, I would say 80% flexible, 20% rigid. Uh, most of the rigid is for malignant area obstruction. I do very little TBM right now because it's an underrecognized disease, and our surgeons here do not do tracheoplasty. So, uh, what other part of it? Uh, oh, oh, okay. So, when I did my fellowship, that was still in the beginning, so that's about 10, 15 years ago. If you talk about a comprehensive fellowship, that's about, I would say, I can name them Deaconess, UPenn, Duke, uh, nothing in the West Coast, nothing in the Bay Area, um, MD Anderson, and uh, uh, the uh, and Leahy, that, that's really the big five that really trains it comprehensively. There's some popping up program because we're not boarded program. I belong to the AABIP executive committee and we're trying to get boarded. So, but right now you have a lot of programs, but I would say a big five to 10 programs in the country. So, and it's not about doing the procedure, it's about dealing with complications and working with people, speaking other people's language. That's, that's the important part. So, thank you. This is really great. Thank you. Appreciate it.